Nitrogen is a key element necessary for a variety of biological molecules, such as proteins and nucleic acids. However, we don't exactly eat the pure elemental nitrogen. That would be kind of weird. In meats and vegetables, nitrogen is present as DNA, RNA, and proteins. You know the phrase, what goes in goes out? Well, animal waste is basically made up of denatured amino acids and nucleotides, the remains of our digested plants and meat. As nitrifying bacteria break down these wastes, two unsavory products can be created, ammonia and nitrates. Now here's the part where plants come in. While nitrates are toxic for us, plants can easily absorb them in a process known as assimilation. Nitrate, a nonpolar molecule, gets taken in by transport proteins located in the plasma membrane. While large amounts of nitrogen in an aquatic ecosystem aren't usually of concern to humans, they can be the cause of major ecosystem imbalance. This act of humans using plants as environmental custodians brings us to the main topic of this episode, phytoremediation. Phytoremediation focuses on using the natural ability of plants to absorb contaminants such as heavy metals, pesticides, oil, and more. There are subsections of phytoremediation, such as rhizoremediation, which relies on symbiotic microbes located at the roots of plants, phytodegradation, which uses plant metabolism to break down organic compounds, and phytofiltration, which is when plants use their roots to filter contaminants from the water. So, I formulated an experiment to put phytoremediation, specifically phytofiltration, to the test. First, I went to the fish store and purchased four floating plants. Why floating? Well, the nitrogen-rich water that I'm testing with is going to be extremely turbid or foggy. A submerged plant would not be able to photosynthesize in the dark, sediment-filled water and probably die. So that way, floating plants would be able to photosynthesize and still remove nitrogen from the water. To make sure all the conditions were identical at the start of the experiment, I separated each type of plant into four identical plastic deli containers. Then I filled each one with water from my aquarium just to make sure they had the same exposure to nitrogen at the beginning of the experiment. I left the plants in the container for three days, then added dirty, dirty water into each container. So even though each plant is a different size, I made sure it was constant by keeping the surface area covered by the plants similar. The point of this experiment was to determine which aquatic plant species is most effective in absorbing nitrogen. By observing which plant is best at uptaking nitrogen, we can infer that that same plant will probably be the best choice for massive or wide-scale phytofiltration. Now, as you watch me zoom through my experiment procedures, here are some facts about each species. First up is duckweed. It's an extremely invasive species found all over North America and many other continents. It's the smallest angiosperm or flowering plant on earth and is often grown as poultry food, as its name indicates. Azoya, also known as mosquito fern. This is an extremely invasive aquatic fern that has a very special symbiotic relationship with cyanobacteria that allows it to fixate nitrogen the same way bacteria can. This one's also used as farm food feed but it's used mainly for cows and horses. Dwarf water lettuce. This plant is very small right now, but when given the chance to grow to its full size, it can get pretty large. So this plant, when at its full size, can have a root system up to four feet in length. And this plant is also invasive and therefore illegal to ship to California. Salvinia natans or floating fern. This is another fern that I purchased and is also my favorite out of the bunch. So this is also extremely invasive due to its quick growing nature, but 
the reason why I love it so much is because of its leaves. So I tried to poke it a bunch of times to see if it was truly hydrophobic, and it was. The fuzzy little things that are found on the leaves prevent water from going on, therefore creating a hydrophobic surface. Now this is beneficial for the plant because it prevents bacteria or other microbes from growing in the cracks of the plants. And so these hairs actually keep the water out, allow the plant to float, and just grow better in its environment. So I ran tests on each of the water samples for four days, testing for ammonia, nitrites, and nitrates. During this time, I witnessed my turtle eat rocks and saw handfuls of planaria, snails, and springtails invade each of the containers. But one broken vial and dozens of tests later, here were the results. So, ammonia was lowest in the salvinia, which can be explained by the higher relative surface area of the roots compared to the other plants. More surface area means more transport proteins that are available to absorb the ammonia. But it could also mean that it has more area to harbor nitrifying bacteria that convert the ammonia to nitrates. For nitrates, salvinia, azoia, and water lettuce tied for removing the most nitrate. And nitrite levels came back zero for all containers. A relief, because anything higher than zero would indicate that the plants would not be doing their job of assimilation, which would be kind of concerning. Overall, all of the planted containers were able to remove more nitrates than the con control container, which contained no plant. Though, the most significant effort award goes to the salvinia. If you ever need to do some phytoremediation, definitely choose salvinia natans as your plant of choice.